Let's just jump right in. Um, uh, folks, I want to introduce you to John Demers. He's the Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the Justice Department. He leads the Justice Department's efforts to combat national security-related cyber crimes, terrorism, espionage, to enforce export control and sanctions laws, and to use the authorities of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to identify threats to, to the country, as well as to conduct national security review of foreign investments. He also leads the AG's China Initiative, which counters uh, economic espionage, trade, sec trade secret theft, hacking, and other related crimes by China. And prior to coming to NSD, uh, he was the VP and Assistant General Counsel of the Boeing Company, and also served as the in the first National Security Division as first a senior counsel to AAG, um, and then as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Law and Policy. And perhaps most important, he was my boss at all times that I worked at the National Security Division at the Justice Department when he was the Deputy AAG. Uh, so, John, thanks for being here with us. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, if it's all right with you, I think we'll just uh, we'll just jump right into it. Yeah, sounds great. So look, you're the, uh, you run the AG's China Initiative. Obviously, there's a lot going on uh, just in the last few weeks alone. Um, on China, we just saw the big announcement from the State Department about uh, the, the Clean Technology Initiative. What can you tell us about the AG's China Initiative and your role running it and what that all means? Yeah, well, thanks, Jamil. And thanks for having me on this, obviously, and all of you out who are listening for the next hour or so as we, we talk about whatever national security topics are on your mind. Starting with China, which is you know, probably the focus of, of much of our efforts right now, the China Initiative, which we formally started you know, a couple of years ago, was really uh, an outgrowth of the intel that we were seeing. So you know, on a regular basis at that time, I think it was three times a week in the morning, the AG and I and some others would be getting briefed from, by the Bureau on you know, whatever the intel was of, of the night before. And it just struck us how much uh, intelligence there was about the theft of intellectual property from China, uh, or you know, emanating from China, and then uh, you know, hitting especially our private sector. So right. the question, what, you know, as we were talking about, is well, what what more can we do about this uh, to confront this? Obviously, the department had already brought several cases involving uh, Chinese thefts of intellectual property, and. Right most sort of seminally back in 2014, uh, the first um, cyber intrusion case charging members of the PLA with robbing intellectual property from private American companies for the benefit of uh, Chinese companies. And that's the People's Liberation Army, the actual military of China conducting cyber operations against American private sector companies to help the Chinese government, is that right? Yes, that's right. So we were obviously building on some of that that had come before. And you can imagine a decision like that was, I was not around in the government in those days, but right. any of us who've been in government or just think about this, I mean, this is a momentous decision to charge the members of another country's military uh, for cyber intrusions. And right. it's more than just a law enforcement decision. Uh, it is really a foreign policy decision. And so, but have, they're having set that precedent. We certainly were you know, willing uh, to build on it. There have been some other cases in the meantime. And so we launched this initiative. And the purpose of it was to really focus the energies of the department, not just here at Maine Justice and NSD, but of the U.S. Attorney's offices right. around the country, 94 U.S. Attorney's offices, and to signal to them that this was a priority of the Attorney General and uh, that we understood that while these cases of economic espionage and trade secret thefts, while these cases are difficult and they take a long time, and if you're in office and you have one in a year, that's great. If you right. have two, that's amazing. If you have none, you know, that's understandable and you'll probably have one next year. These are not drug cases. These are not gun cases. These are not immigration cases where you can really point to the numbers and say, look what this office did, right? Yeah. He wanted to signal to them, this, that's not the metric that we worry about. We want you to do these cases. They're hard. They involve working with the intelligence community. Right. Got to negotiate the different equities that are at play there because at the end and of the day we're only going to yeah. charge no, keep going, keep going. if we can uh you know prove it beyond a reasonable doubt using unclassified admissible right. evidence in court and so a lot of the intelligence we get you know is either inadmissible or it's too classified and and you have right. to work with the intelligence community to see whether they'd be willing to declassify it in a way you can use it so these are tough cases we get that and we were you know, signaling to the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, though, that these were very important cases for us to do. And I think, you know, starting there uh, and, 
you know, moving forward now, the, um, you know, the proof is in the number of cases that have come out uh, of uh, this initiative. Um, and the focus of the Bureau, of course, as well on this uh, issue. And, you know, increasingly, uh, and, and this needs to be sort of a whole of government response. Yeah. We're not going to just prosecute our way out of, out of this issue. Uh, you know, we see a lot of um, sort of whole of government efforts to try to combat this. Yeah, and I, I do want to talk about how effective sort of bringing these charges is. But, you know, it, it looks like you, you know, as you talk about the number of cases you brought just in the last few years alone under the new administration, um, it looks like, I mean, you're targeting, you know, the Chinese military officers, you're targeting American college professors who may have taken money from China without disclosing. Um, and there's cases are all around the country now, as you say, working with these 94 U.S. attorney's offices, not just in high tech power centers, not just in Silicon Valley, not just in D.C., not just in New York. Is this Chinese effort really as widespread as it appears? Is it really targeting all sort of aspects of American public private life? Um, and how successful would you say that your initiative to counter China's push um, has been? So on the first question, it is as widespread as it appears. Where a good starting point is to look at the Made in China 2025 plan. So that's a plan that they issued in uh, 2015. It's one of a series of five and 10 year plans that that they issue, obviously being a sort of top-down, centrally controlled uh, government, and communist. it it uh, yes, communist government. It um, you know it lays out the ten areas of technology in which they want to have significant, um, and in their definition, by 2025, 70 percent domestic production capability in each one of these areas of technology. And when you look at it, you see the breadth of the ambition because it's everything from agricultural products and machinery to right. uh, aerospace, to high-speed rail, to uh, new materials, to uh, battery, you know, electric batteries, all of that. So you, yeah. biomedical, which has now become, you know, of heightened interest because of the, the COVID research. Uh, so all of these areas aren't just as you might think of when you start this. And look, if you look at the behavior of a country like China, I mean, sorry, like Russia, they're much more focused on military technologies, yeah. right? The Chinese certainly include military technologies in what they want to steal, both for their own intelligence purposes and for their own uh, production and technology capabilities. But it's a lot broader than that. It's about developing the Chinese economy in part by uh, taking intellectual property from the U.S. and other Western nations in order to develop this domestic capability. So I've called it the rob, replicate, and replace approach to economic uh, development. Rob the American company of its IP, replicate the product, and then right. replace the U.S. company first on the Chinese market, and then if all goes well, on the global market. And yeah. We had several examples of that happening across industries, but that's why you're seeing these cases popping up all around the country and in all types of industries. So just to be clear, so what, what, what's happening here is the Chinese government either, you know, directly with its own military officers and the like, or through proxies. I know you guys recently charged uh, a case where they where they essentially these sort of criminal actors, right? Uh, they've allowed criminal yeah. class actors to grow up, uh, but then they're using it for state purposes also. Is that is that right? Yeah, so there are a couple of different kinds of cases that I think have developed over time. Yeah. As I said, the seminal case was a cyber intrusion case back in 2014, right? Military officers doing cyber intrusion, stealing intellectual property. Right. Um, most of our cases today, now we've done other cyber cases, including the one that you mentioned just a couple of weeks ago, we did another cyber case. Most of the cases we do are insider cases. So they're individuals who either have been co-opted by Chinese intelligence officers, uh, in much the same way, using the same trade craft that these intelligence officers will use to try to co-opt you know, U.S. intelligence officers or other people with access to yeah. traditional government military secrets. Um, either people who are co-opted or people who have been um, incentivized by programs like the Thousand Talents program, which will pay uh, individuals for their talent, yes, and that part is fine, obviously, but also for the intellectual property and technology that they bring to China. And that part, of course, is, is not fine. And right. so most of the cases we have right now, just in, in the numbers of cases, involve you know, individuals who are really here. So when you talk, you know, then, Jamil, about 
how effective are these charges? Those kinds of cases are very traditional uh, use of prosecutorial power, right. where you're trying to deter the behavior, obviously, of the individual by stopping it, and then, you know, trying to achieve general deterrence by signaling to other people who may be doing this or thinking of doing this that, you know, they're, they could be facing arrest in the future as well. On the cyber side, you know, it's much more rare, although it's happened, that we have uh, actually caught and brought somebody here. Yeah. So there, the purpose of the charges is slightly different. And that is to, uh, one, to try to develop over time and increasingly with other like-minded nations an international norm against certain government uses of cyberspace. So you'll notice that, for instance, we have not charged what I would call traditional military or intelligence activity uh, from uh, China or from, for that matter, from Russia or Korea for cyber actors. Obviously, if you catch a spy here, you charge them, you right. change them for a spy, that kind of thing. But in terms of cyber activity, what we're trying to do is say some things are beyond the norms of acceptable nation state behavior. One of them is theft of intellectual property for the purpose of benefiting your own private sector. That's right. China. On the North Korean side, obviously, they've been engaged in cyber bank robbery. That's another thing we think that uh, nation states should not engage in. So we're trying to develop these norms. We're trying to develop them with other countries. When we announced these charges, the last time I think we had five or six countries around the world join us in uh, the condemnation of that behavior on the part of the Chinese. Um, the time before that, which is sort of a broader based hacking conspiracy, we had about 12 nations around the world. We're trying to develop that. You right. saw the, the Germans, for instance, charged their first cyber hackers. They were trying to, Russians who were trying to hack into their parliament. Um, and so we're, we're trying to develop that practice around the world of setting down these norms. And we're also trying to educate companies and the private sector and academia that there are folks out there who want their um, intellectual property. And there's nothing like these cases that I think lay that out. Right. Well, so let's talk about that. So, so you mentioned that you're trying to create these norms and you mentioned how we don't charge generally uh, sort of classic cyber spying, right? So if you're going in and, you know, you hack the OPM database, say the Chinese did that and stole right. it and took it back to, uh, to, 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 uh, to China, we're not, we're not going to charge things like that. But, but then you mentioned Germany is charging people hacking their parliament. Is, are yeah. they really getting the international norm or are they sort of missing the point here? Well, it's interesting. I mean, we, we also charged the Russians for messing in the 2016 election, for hacking right. and dumping election emails. I think, you know, those are, uh, you know, the, the norms depend a little bit on how you define them. Um, you know, our view on that, although, so one of those indictments was from the special counsel's office, one of them, two of them were right. from, from here. Um, we had to lay down a marker about Russian interference in U.S. democracy. And yeah. that's so yeah. there are certain lines where you might where you might go yeah. further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, 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 talk to me about this this idea that you know, so the so Chinese government's stealing this data from from American companies. What does the government want? I mean, are they giving it to Chinese quote unquote private companies to to build the stuff? You said rob, replicate, replace. Yeah. Are they are they literally handing the data over to Chinese companies? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or, you know, the companies themselves are stealing it with a wink and a nod from the government. Right. And that's a little bit of what you saw reflected in that last cyber case. But, you know, for instance, um, and I, there was another, so one of the cases we brought, which is a little older case, but a company called Sinoval enters, which is a Chinese company that enters into a joint venture with an American wind turbine manufacturing company. A employee of the joint venture steals the key intellectual property was, was the software that uh, regulated the interaction between the turbine and the electric grid. Right. So that from the American company, that was really their competitive advantage. Brought it over, gave, gave it to the Chinese company. They broke up the joint venture. They ended up, you know, they entered into individual supply contracts with people who were at one time customers of the joint venture. And they pushed that American company partly out of the market. So that's, you know, not necessarily happening with direct government intervention. But if you look at it, the government has set the goals for where it wants its companies to be. So one right. more recent case we had at, still pending out of San Francisco, 
um, the government, which involves DRAM, which is a kind of sort of basic computer memory chip, which is not terribly sophisticated, but it's ubiquitous, right? right. And Chinese are sick of importing billions of dollars a year in these chips from the West, right? So okay. at a goal, at the very highest levels of the government, they decide we're going to have domestic production capability in these chips. The government commits four, five, six billion dollars to build a factory, set up a company called Fuzhou and Xinhua uh, in China, and then to have that company now, you know, enters into a joint venture with a Taiwan company, uh, and that that JV poaches two employees from uh, the Taiwanese subsidiary of of uh, Micron, which is an American maker of those chips, right. approaches them not in the way of like, wow, you're a really talented manager. I wish you'd come over and, you know, share your, your talents with us. You know, a, a, a precondition of coming over is you bring your technology with you. And right. so, again, there, you know, maybe it's the company at a certain level that's setting up this scheme and effectuating the scheme, but they're doing so responsive to a direction and investment by the Chinese government. Right to uh, have domestic capability to create this technology. That makes sense. So, so you know, I'm actually going to take questions from the audience while we're talking, if that's all right with you. Um, yeah. And folks, yeah. the audience, if you have questions, just go ahead and throw them in the question and answer box down at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll take them as we go along. So Dimitri Alperovich uh, asks, are you planning on, chi on uh, planning to indict any of these Chinese companies uh, that benefit from the IP theft? Well, that's a good question, Dimitri. Um, we are... Uh, I, I don't know if indict is the right approach with those companies. I mean, we did go after Fujian Jinwa. They are a, a defendant in that, that case. Um, so there are times where if a company has been directly involved, we've indicted them. Other times, the companies are the beneficiaries, maybe, of the theft by the Chinese government or somebody else. The key there is being able to trace the technology from uh, the... Uh, the theft to the new company. Uh, and then, you know, I think the real issue is would we sanction that company? So in right. the case of, uh, in the Micron case I talked about, the most effective remedy, I think, to the wrong was that the Commerce Department put the Chinese company on the denied entity list. Now, what that means to non-export control people is that company can't import anything from the U.S. And what it needed to import was the tooling to make the parts it had stolen the intellectual property. Right. So now, having been denied the ability to import the tooling, they were never able to benefit from their theft, although we do believe they ended up getting the intellectual property, but they didn't have the tooling to do anything with. So I think that rather than indictments in terms of those companies, you know, a fruitful approach is things like Commerce Department authorities and things like uh, U.S. Treasury sanctions authority uh, to look at that. You can also use uh, more classified evidence when you're uh, executing under those authorities. So it's, right. it's a little simpler than uh, bringing cases. So John, you know, one of the things about this this IP that you're talking about is that it really hits, you know, sort of the heart of America's new innovation economy, right? And at the heart of that economy are Silicon Valley and D.C. and Boston startups, right? Funded by venture right. capital. Um, and so Don Dixon uh, from 420 Capital asks, how can the U.S. government assist startup companies to defend themselves against nation-state industrial espionage before their IP is stolen? It's at the heart of their company. They're, they're spending all their money on developers and the like. Right. Uh, what can the government do to help those, those companies? Or what should those companies be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, look, that's really tough because with startups, you know, as you say, they're spending their money on developing the idea that they've had into something that they, you know, will be able to sell down the road or, or turn into a product. Um, and they're not, and at the beginning, they probably think that they're, they're not that vulnerable to intellectual property theft, because who really knows about them, right? They don't have a high um, visibility. But I have to say that, you know, we have seen cases in which some pretty small companies have been the subject of intellectual property theft uh, on the part of China. So, uh, you know, I think what one thing we've tried to do, and I think Don, you know, is aware of this part of it, which is, you know, working with uh, venture capital, working with private equity, obviously two different things, but working with 
especially on the private equity side, with individuals who are going to take an ownership stake in these companies, but have a much higher level of sophistication about yeah. what the risks are and about how to protect um, against these kinds of threats. And so that, you know, we ultimately will need the help of the private sector, I think, to address the issues that we're talking about. Um, we, you know, we do try, certainly every company, Company, I hope has some uh, kind of relationship with their local FBI office because that's the greatest uh, source of information, you know, the, and the, per, the people where you want to go uh, if you have questions about something that you're seeing or right. developing that relationship so that hopefully even the Bureau is, is coming to you if they see something that they need to warn you about. But ultimately, I think the smaller companies are real, especially the startups, are a real challenge. Uh, they're often not focused on this issue. Even if they are focused on it, they probably feel like they're not as vulnerable as they are. And then, frankly, they just have to prioritize where they're spending their time and their money. Right. Uh, so at the very early stage, it's going to be especially tough. Once they start getting investments, I think, you know, educating investors and uh, because ultimately it's about protecting your investment if you're an investor in one of these companies. Right about what the, um, what, what the risks are and then uh, trying to leverage the sophistication that they may have to help those companies protect their IP. Yeah, so, so moving off sort of the venture front, but we have a question from another, another venture capitalist, uh, Courtney Hall, who, uh, who runs Hillcrest Venture Partners. Um, what level of, in these joint ventures, definitely these joint ventures and how that's oftentimes a way of IP theft, either by somebody walking out the back door um, or, or force transfers of intellectual property, right? Yeah. Uh, when you try to do business in China. But Courtney wants to know, what level of coordination or infiltration do you suspect when those types of joint ventures are formed? Is it, is it happening all the time? Is it sort of the standard thing? Is it, is it happening to our allies also? Well, look, we're definitely not unique uh, around the world in this. I think any country that has cutting edge technology in any of those areas in the Made in China 2025 plan or that are otherwise of interest to the, to the government uh, and to the companies there is at risk. And so absolutely, if you're a European company, if you're a Japanese company, an Australian company, you're facing the same risks. Um, on the joint venture side, I mean, there was even an excellent uh, op-ed about a week ago in the Wall Street Journal in which uh, an individual business owner gave his story of how he yeah. entered into a joint venture with a Chinese company and ended up having all of his intellectual property stolen. Um, yeah. That, that's one version. The other version is the more sort of open, in some ways, forced technology transfer, which is if you're going to do, if you're going to sell into our market, you're going to, you know, set up some kind of operations here, and you're going to put a certain amount of intellectual property here, yeah. and then, you know, you're going to share that with your partner. Um, that That's almost a, a more open way. The... Um, you know, a lot of the focus on the trade side has been to try to uh, combat that kind of forced technology transfer and get agreements to do that. We'll see how that works. I mean, as you know, since 2015, the the Chinese had committed to reduce their cyber intrusions also. Right. Conduct cyber intrusions for the benefit of their private sector. And, you know, they didn't stick with that commitment for very long. So the, the difficulty in all of these agreements, I think, is the enforcement mechanism. Right. So is it fair to say that the Chinese have violated their agreement with uh, President Obama uh, to, to, to neck down their, uh, their economic espionage? Yeah, I mean, we've said it because we've charged conduct that postdates that agreement. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think, it's, I think one, of the, one of the challenges here, right, is, uh, is that we're, we're pretty intertwined with, uh, with the Chinese in terms of our economy. We buy yeah. a lot of goods from China. Uh, Christopher Milling asks, um, you know, uh, given how entwined our economy is with China, um, how much of this is really limiting our ability, that, inter, that sort of interconnected nature to combat this espionage? Is it just a cost of doing business? I mean, what is it? Can we really, can we really effectively go after them if, if our economies are tied to, so tightly together? Well, I think, look, it's induced us to look the other way for a very long time, right? I mean, not, nothing that I'm saying here is terribly new uh, to anyone who has been doing business in China. So, but the benefits of doing business there were thought to have been worth at least to some degree the cost. Now, that might have been an underappreciation of what the costs truly were. Right. And I think a failure to recognize that, you know, it, it's not about like taking 20% off the top. Ultimately, it's about replacing you in the market. So, um, you're, you know, you, 
you may be looking at some short-term benefits of, of entering the Chinese market, but you know, if you really are going to give up your or have stolen from you your key differentiating technology, um, you could easily be out of business over time. Yeah. So I think you know, we looked the other way for a long time. We, I think, thought maybe overly optimistically that once the Chinese really began to develop and their economic development took off, and look, they've done wonders. They have raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China in the last 30 years. Uh, and that is all to the good. And I think we thought, you know, once that really got underway, that they wouldn't uh, use these kinds of means to develop right. themselves economically. But that's proven not to be true. Uh, and it's, it's increased, I would say, over time, the level of, and, and the, the scope, the persistence, and the means by which uh, they steal intellectual property. I mean, the fact that you would use highly trained intelligence officers, yeah. co-op engineers at U.S. aerospace companies uh, to, um, you know, get the engineering that you need to further your commercial jet engine development is, uh, you know, just a testament to how committed the country is and has become over time to uh, economic development, including through, you know, one of these means being theft of intellectual property. So the case I'm referring to is an intel officer who we arrest, the Belgians arrested on our warrant and then extradited to us. Uh, and he was thinking he was going to Belgium to meet with this American engineer whom he had, uh, co-opted uh, right. to take intellectual property about commercial jet engines. Um, that was, uh, you know, the first time we've ever done it with the first time we've ever extradited an intelligence officer from another country to the U S um, it's again, that's an area. It's not something we would do if we were talking about traditional intelligence activity, but this guy was, was stealing jet engine uh, secrets. So I, I think, you know, we, we did look the other way for a long time. Uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of companies are reconsidering that now. I do yeah. think there are still ways, I'm not in the camp of people who say you shouldn't do business with China or you should separate from China. I think there are ways of continuing to uh, do business with China, but you do have to be careful to guard the true, and, and even to put operations in China, but, but you can't put that piece of intellectual property that truly is your competitive advantage in yeah. China, or I believe it will get stolen. Well, you know, John, uh, some people said, look, the Chinese are doing it. Uh, why shouldn't we just do it ourselves? Why don't we just put our, the tools of our intelligence apparatus to work? Let's go conduct economic espionage on them. You know, two can play this game too. We can probably do it better. Why not just try and compete on that front? Why are we trying to sort of, you know, coach them into better behavior? Well, look, I think we have a norm against theft, uh, first of all. Uh, that well, but we, know, do it, we do it in the spying context. Right? Yeah, That's you know, in the spying, everybody. I was going to say, yeah. in the spying context, obviously, we have different um, sort of different framework for analyzing that kind of behavior. But we also, um, you know, I think it's just a hallmark of a more capitalistic approach not to have the government taking and then choosing, okay, now you got to choose which country in the United States you're going to give this intellectual property to to be your champion in this area. Right. Yeah. Like it, it works better in a centrally planned uh, economy than it does in one where uh, the government really isn't willing to, to play that role. And then the other thing is, look, if we start to engage in this, this conduct is going to proliferate around the world more than it even has. And, and, you know, one of the things we're trying to do when I talk about establishing these norms is we are also trying to send a signal to other developing countries and saying, this is not the way that you ought to develop. Right. Uh, don't be tempted by China's success in this area. This isn't, this isn't good for anyone. If, and if we just said, eh, forget it, we're also going to steal, and we're going to steal from China, we're going to steal something from Vietnam, and we're going to steal something from, you know, the Philippines. And stuff. I mean, it's just, at that point, it, be, it ends up being a bit of a Hobbesian world. Yeah. You know, Harold Moss, one of our visiting fellows and, uh, and a former uh, senior at, uh, at IBM and Akamai, um, asked about, you know, the role of U.S. companies and, and whether we have a responsibility to protect ourselves better, we, you know, U.S. companies. And he wants to know if, you're, if we plan to penalize U.S. companies that have substandard protections or enable sort of this bad behavior. Is, is there a line between sort of, you know, negligence and, and allowing, to walk out the, allowing your own IP to walk out the back door? I mean, look, we don't. I mean, we, we 
tend not to try to penalize victims of crimes for leaving themselves vulnerable to crime, regardless of what the crime is. Uh, that company is going to pay a price. It's going to pay an economic price by having a new competitor on the market that it's going to it's going to have lost market share. Uh, so I don't I don't I'm not I don't think we need to sort of penalize them from a government perspective any more than they're already going to already going to be penalized from a market perspective. And if those market incentives aren't working to you know, get them to pay more attention to cybersecurity and get them to uh, pay more attention to intellectual property theft, then I don't know how much more incentive, you know, what we do would provide. Yeah. You know, Dimitri has another question and Dimitri, you know, found, uh, founded CrowdStrike. Um, and uh, and he, he says that he's uh, of recent been seeing more cyber activity from China in critical infrastructure sectors um, and in targets with, with, without the usual sort of economic espionage value, right? Are you seeing that also? And how concerned are you about uh, that, uh, particularly with the potential for, you know, the Chinese to uh, be pre-positioned like the Russians do uh, for a future disruptive event if and when there's some sort of larger conflict? Well, these are probably things that are a little easier for you guys to say than me. So, uh, you know, I, it's absolutely true that the Chinese behavior in cyberspace is not exclusive to theft of intellectual property. And they are also engaging in behaviors, certain behaviors that other countries engage in uh, that are, you know, let's say more, maybe more traditional government behaviors. Uh, so I, I don't really want to get into what I'm seeing because of the way in which I see it. But sure. uh, the Chinese cyberspace behavior isn't just about stealing IP. Right, right. Uh, Jerry Dunleavy, who's a reporter with the Washington Examiner, so we're obviously in a public setting, um, wants to know uh, whether you can provide more details about what, we're, what we know about Chinese espionage efforts being run through embassies and consulates um, and the role of Chinese intelligence, the military here inside the U.S. And obviously, you know, we know about the, the, shut, the closure of the, of the Chinese uh, consulate in Houston. Tell us if you, if you can anything about that. I um, mean, we've also seen you know, the list of companies, the 10, 10, or, 14, 10 or 12 companies that uh, DOD put out recently, uh, Chinese companies that are operating in the United, United States but are controlled by the Chinese military. What can you tell us about the role of these consulates and embassies and, and whether the intelligence, their intelligence the military are playing a role here in the U.S.? So, um, well, first of all, I, I kind of figured I was in a public setting since I'm staring at what looks like your back porch. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, actually, picture, so. I'm actually by the beach in Delaware, which is nice. Oh, nice. Uh, even better. Yeah, even better. <laughs> Some Airbnb back porch. There you go, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but um, look, on the consulate side, obviously um, the government ordered the, the Chinese to close their embassy last week. Um, and one of, the, there were a couple of factors that played into that. Um, they ultimately, it was meant to disrupt two lines of behavior uh, associated with that, embassy, with that consulate, although not exclusively so. You know, on the one hand, covert foreign influence activity, and then on the other, the uh, enabling uh, theft of intellectual property. And as a part of that, we saw obviously the uh, arrests of several associates of the, the PLA who were here without having declared their affiliation uh, with the army. And, uh, but we're here on J-1 visas to do research here in the U.S. In a, in a variety of areas. Uh, and um, what we learned as we, did, as we started to do interviews of these individuals, uh, some of whom were later arrested, was uh, the role that after the first arrest that we did in uh, Los Angeles airport, that the Chinese consulates were you know, reaching out to these individuals who they knew were here on these visas and we're instructing them on how to um, answer questions that U.S. government agents would be asking them, on how to clean up their phones and other electronic devices, uh, all in an effort to evade uh, detection of their actual affiliation. So yeah, the consulates, uh, you know, were uh, very much involved, and what that told us was that this initial arrest was part of a broader problem, right? Yeah. And this was a more programmatic attempt. And, and we, we, we've known this for some time. We have arrested other PLA officers here who were here undeclared in the past. Um, but the, the breadth of it, I think, here was something we learned as we started to do the interviews that we did. 
and uh, that the consulates were involved in, um, you know, trying to further this this conduct. The, yeah, I mean, uh, also been involved in recruiting for the Thousand Talents program that we talked about right. before. In you know, so yeah, they, they're involved in this kind of activity. And look, up to a certain point, you expect consulates of a adversary nation to be doing uh, malign activity in your country. Right. But the one in Houston, in particular, I think the bureau and and others felt had crossed the line. Yeah, and actually, Jerry's got a related question on on on, uh, on the Thousand Towns program and, and the Confucius Institute's light. I'll come back to that, but I do want to stay on this topic for a second. So, you know, it, it, one of my favorite stories, sort of, that I think you guys recently indicted was this uh, this uh, Chinese uh, PLA officer who's here in the U.S. Um, but whose whose uh, visa was expiring, right, and needed to renew the visa. Gets in communication with the Chinese embassy or the Chinese consulate um, and tells them. <laughs> That uh, look, I, I'm a I'm a PLA officer. I'm not I'm not I'm not. That's not known to the U.S. government. It may not be known clearly known to the U.S. government. Uh, but I've already gotten clearance from my from the relative, relevant intelligence agencies and uh, and just hey, can you clear this for me? I mean, it's sort of a, I, I, tell us how that went. I mean, it's kind of an astounding p revelation that you guys are putting in the public record um, that you sort of were able to you know identify that communication and and really sort of have this have this person sort of dead to rights. Tell us about how that. What can you tell us about how that came about? <laughs> If anything, I mean, you might not be able uh, yeah. to. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, you know, I, I, I probably, I probably can't go further than that in terms of identifying right. how, you know, we capture that communication. Right. But, you know, as I said, once we started doing these interviews of these officers, uh, and you know, we're also aware of the people who are here on visa, so you can sort of start to do research uh, right. on the individual, just sort of open, even open source research. Right, right. Some of she that put is, on a resume, right? She put the yeah, on a resume. And, and research and see who these people really are. And that's something, you know, that I think we have looked at more. I think there was a recent Hoover Institute report on this too, which is how can we better use open source research to uncover some of these individuals yeah. who are here? Because there's a lot, especially on the Chinese language side, that's actually just out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other question from Jerry on the Thousand Towns program was, um, um, you know, uh, what can you say about Chinese efforts on campus, right? Uh, use, including their funding of universities, the Confucius Institutes, the Thousand Towns program. I mean, we, we obviously saw the indictment of, of that Harvard professor. Yeah. Um, is there, are you seeing a lot of that activity and more of that activity? And are we, and are, are, you know, are we likely to see more indictments of Americans coming here soon? Well, there have been a lot of cases, as you know, in the last, say, nine months or so of, maybe even a year of U.S. academics who have been indicted on various permutations of basically fraud charges um, for participating in Thousand Talents programs, taking money from China and not disclosing it uh, either to the university, to the federal grant making agency, uh, or in the, the superseding indictment in the, the Harvard case to the IRS as income as well. So our focus on the, the university piece where it comes to the talent programs is transparency. So we, uh, you know, there, unless the research that the university is doing is classified, uh, obviously where we maintain control over the information or export controls, we're not gonna tell the university what of its information it should protect. We're yeah. going to explain, as we have, what the risks are, what various actors are out to get. And um, what, we, what we are going to do is enforce uh, transparency, transparency in federal funding. We do expect universities to have strong conflict of commitment and conflict of interest policies where professors have to come forward and declare these other affiliations that they have. Right. Um, and obviously disclosures if it comes to, you know, to tax violations as well. So our focus there is transparency. And then the universities can decide whether this relationship with a Chinese government or Chinese university is one that is beneficial to them versus one that's beneficial to the professor. What we've had right. in all these cases are basically, you know, we had one case against an institute that the professor was open to the Institute about his affiliations, but the Institute was hidden from the US government. The rest of them have been people who have hidden from their universities. One guy who recently pled guilty, you know, he, he committed to entering the Thousand Towns program. He committed to working at a university in China, 
but that required him to teach in China for nine months. Uh, and so he told the school he needed paternity leave, right? And then wow. he didn't go on paternity leave. He went and, and taught, uh, you know, in China. So we're really focused on cases in which people are hiding their affiliations uh, with, the, with the Thousand Talents program. And that's a big area where NIH, HHS, you know, the, the big U.S. grant-making agencies are also focused. They don't want people double-dipping in Chinese money and U.S. money for the same research project. Right, right. You know, we saw uh, in, these, in this indictment from a couple of weeks ago, um, we saw indictments about, about talking about the coronavirus pandemic and the efforts to yeah. obtain, uh, obtain information on the coronavirus research. What can you tell us about that effort? Are, we, are you guys seeing an uptick in Chinese efforts? To, to get into our companies in order to steal this research? And if so, how is it widespread and is it, and are we worried that uh, that will result in them uh, being able to get ahead of us uh, when it comes to uh, vaccine research? Well, I, what we're, look, it shouldn't surprise anybody that the Chinese would be stealing coronavirus research. We, biomedical uh, technologies are on their Made in China 2025 plan. Yeah. We've charged cases over the years that involve the theft of uh, biomedical technologies. The latest one we got a guilty plea on just, I guess, either earlier this week or the end of last week, is uh, from a, a, a woman who was stealing away uh, a method of taking blood samples from premature babies, you know, in, in small enough amounts that it doesn't harm the baby, but then in large enough amounts that it can be analyzed. Um, so we're, we've seen this for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. right now, coronavirus research treatments are, you know, the holy grail of um, the biomedical field. There is a geopolitical advantage, obviously, to being the first to create a vaccine. And there's just a financial one as well. And so, you know, none of this should be surprising to anybody. I would be surprised if they weren't doing it, honestly. Um, it isn't limited to the case that we charged without going into too much detail on stuff we haven't charged. That is just one example of what we've seen uh, occurring at various uh, research institutes around the country and government agencies around the country. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, look, I hope that the Chinese do develop a vaccine and I hope that we do and the UK does and then, you know, the whole world will be better off if we can do this research and development, but the whole world is not better off when we're stealing from one another. And so that's the part that, you know, we're trying to call out and put an end to. Right, and on that front, you've talked about the need to adapt our enforcement strategy to, to reach non-traditional collectors. Who are these non-traditional collectors and what do we, do we need a sort of fundamental shift in the way we, our strategy to addressing the threat? Well, the non-traditional collectors is a big, pot of very different people. They could be anything from students and researchers who are here um, to uh, individuals like the ones we were talking about who have been uh, seduced by the, uh, the, the Thousand Talents program. So they're, they're, you know, basically not intelligence officers, right? Not military officers. Uh, there are people from all walks of life, though, who have been approached and have uh, decided to collect information on behalf of or for, for the benefit of the Chinese government. So I think a lot of what you're seeing is in fact an adaptation of enforcement strategies. A lot of what, what you're seeing, even with this focus on um, PLA affiliated individuals is an adaptation of, of, an, of an enforcement strategy. And also a recognition that look, those four cases that we've brought are uh, the tip of this problem. Uh, yeah. And our move in Houston was to disrupt their ability to conduct this program. And, uh, and, and that's a recognition that we're not just going to prosecute our way through this. We need to have this whole of government effort and focus right. on, in this case, you know, the abuse of, of research visas. Yeah. Speaking of whole of government efforts, one of the things that you, that we mentioned at the top when we were talking about your bio uh, was your role in, in the CFIUS process, right? Uh, which has changed yeah. quite a bit uh, in response in part to the threat from China with the enactment of FIRMA up on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, Senator Cornyn lead that effort, and one of our visiting fellows uh, was one that was, yep. was instrumental in that effort. Uh, uh, and I guess I'm interested to know, um, you know, how how effective, and actually this is a question from Don Dixon, how effective has CFIUS been historically in, in stopping IP theft, and, and do have these changes uh, in FIRMA 
uh, that Dave Hankey worked on. Have those changes been effective um, in moving the ball forward and, and limiting IP theft by China? I think the changes have been uh, helpful. In, now, a part of them were really recognizing things that we were already doing. So calling out specifically, for instance, um, as a national security risk, acquisitions of large data sets of sensitive personal information. That's something that we had, had started you know, looking at, uh, certainly following the OPM hack, and, and as we came to appreciate China's appetite for all this, these big databases of sensitive personal information. And that's brought into the CFIUS process companies that in the past would have never dreamt that they would have been part of it. So you know, if, you, if you're thinking of CFIUS as technology focused, which is really where it started, then if you're a financial services company, or if you're a health insurer, you're never going to think that you need to be, you know, right. go through the biggest process. But in fact, you have tremendous amounts of uh, sensitive personal data on Americans that's of interest to, to foreign countries. And so you, you, you do need to go through that. So I think the expansion in CFIUS in the kinds of risks that we're looking at has been effective. I think, you know, what's not necessarily reflected in the law but reflected in practice is from the days, Jamil, where you may remember that we were working on it together 10 years ago, um, there was this traditional split between sort of the commercial agencies and then the national security agencies. And uh, the, there's a lot more consensus uh, within the interagency about what the national security risks are. Um, and you're not having that traditional sort of commerce, USTR, state on one side, while DOD, DOJ, and DHS are on the other side. There's a, people are, uh, uh, as I said, there's just a lot more consensus and they're more, I would say, on the national security side than they have been in the past. So I think it helps. Um, it's just a piece of this uh, puzzle. I think we have to get better at parts of it. I know you were working on, you know, project to make sure that there wasn't a loophole through the bankruptcy process, right. various uh, technologies. So there are areas where I think we continue to have to, to strengthen this process, but I, I do think it's, it's helped. And it's not just in, you know, the blocks are few and far between, but uh, we have used a lot of uh, mitigation agreements, especially yeah. when we're focused on data and where the data is located and who has access to data and how you monitor all that. And look, these mitigation agreements are trying to, to um, hoe this line between national security and keeping an open investment climate. And so if we can find a way to mitigate the risk, we will do that. And, uh, but if we can't, then you know, there may need to be a block. And there's many more transactions that are not visible because this process is so confidential where you know, folks withdraw. Uh, right. and there's no public mention of that. Uh, and then I believe there are many that are not brought to us because uh, they, you know, people don't even enter into that transaction because right. they're not going to get uh, yeah. approval for that. And I think as the bar, CFIUS bar, which is kind of a small specialized group, has gotten more and more used to the kinds of things we're looking for, that, that's been very helpful to us because they, they come in with well-educated clients. Yeah. Uh, so I want to take two more questions before we close. We only got a few minutes left, so just we'll make we'll make these quick. Uh, Jeremy Kahn asks, "What can we do to dissuade the tit for tat detentions? Uh, we we arrest uh, Americans here, legitimate arrests here, then they uh, they, in, or they illegitimately arrest Americans overseas uh, or in China. How do we how do we deal with that?" Well, you know, I think um, we have seen some of that, although not as badly as other countries have suffered from that. For instance, there are two Canadians who we believe are illegitimately detained as a result of the fact that the Canadians right. arrested the Huawei CFO on our behalf. Um, the, the way to deal with it, I think, is not to capitulate to it uh, in the long run, but that's obviously very painful for those individuals and their families, uh, but also to, to signal to them that there will be other costs to that kind of behavior. I think the Chinese so far have been a little more careful on the U.S. side than they have been uh, with respect to some other countries yeah. but that that's a it's a tough one it's like all of these hostage taking issues that you deal with on the terrorism side as well yeah and then a question from paula doyle uh formerly the cia 
Um, she notes that uh, more and more U.S. industries have been and, and companies have been bought, have been hiring former FBI and IC personnel to establish intelligence and security programs um, and to sort of uh, create homegrown collection analytic programs to identify what's happening to them with respect to Russia and China. Um, what is your what's your thought on that trend? Well, look, I, generally, I think it's good. I mean, I, when former FBI folks go into companies and former IC folks, they understand uh, one what the risks are to that company because that's what they were working on. And two, they understand what, uh, what we're looking at in, in terms of risks, how it is to work with the government. They're usually more comfortable working with the government than sometimes people have never been in government. Yeah. And we do need that connective tissue between the public sector and the private sector. And I think that folks who have left government, especially from these law enforcement agencies, uh, help to provide that. And there are just great companies out there who are doing really good work uh, collecting uh, intelligence and information about what the risks are either to their own companies or as a service to, to other companies. And that's also to our benefit. I don't think that you know, government is the beginning and the end of the solution here. Right. Uh, we need that effort from the private sector as well. Well, John, I think that's a great uh, note to end on. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks to the audience for joining us today. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media at Mason, at Mason Natsek. Um, and, uh, and join us next Thursday, August 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern for our, our next event in the Technology Innovation and American National Security Series. We'll have great panels joining us, including Aaron Hughes, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber Policy at DOD, Randy Milch, the former General Counsel of Verizon, Sam Ravitch, uh, one of the commissioners on the Cyberspace Commission, um, and, uh, and the, Depu the uh, Vice Chair of the PAB, and Ron Gula, one of our advisory board members, the president of Gula Tech Adventures, will be actually uh, moderating the event. And also, don't forget to join us in two weeks for the next installment of NATSEC uh, Nightcap with Ambassador Ruben E. Brigady, the former uh, U.S. rep to the African Union and permanent rep to the U.N. Economic Commission. It'll be same channel, same place, August 20th, 5 to 6 p.m. John, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Uh, by the way, folks, at the end of this thing, you'll be able to complete a short survey. There's links to the survey as well as to our events to sign up and an op-ed that I recently wrote on China. So take a look at that. John, thanks for being here. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks a awesome, lot. Man. Thanks, Jamil. Really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who listen, was listening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.